the Administrative Reforms Commission report, they said corruption is of two kinds, grand corruption and retail. The last three years, the grand corruption and retail corruption has made so much of difference in our polity. And what is it? Grand corruption started with Bofors, and the, the case was not proved, the gun was brilliant, but yet it destroyed a, uh, a government elected with 410 plus MPs, and they came down to numbers less than one third, just because of the word corruption. I don't know why the uh, Congress forgot that lesson. Perhaps they forgot that lesson that from 1889, to 2009, people didn't bother about corruption. They were more concerned about caste, province, uh, creed, uh, religion, and voted accordingly. Did not vote according to the tenets of ethics and corruption. And then came, suddenly, a movement which started in Karnataka. It started in Karnataka, courtesy uh, Justice Hegde. People in Delhi seem to have forgotten that movement, where Despite being a government servant, a Lok Ayukt, he almost led a movement against corruption, and that had enormous impact on the polity in Karnataka. Next, of course, was, uh, 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 was uh, when uh, in the last two, three years, there was enormous amount of corruption. Uh, 2G, coal gate, helicopter gate, CWG, etc. And uh, the government was not concerned. The government was not concerned about the number of complaints that were happening. No one was concerned. Uh, uh, people were going, having meetings in the Home Ministry on the Lokpal Bill, on the Lok Ayukt uh, Bill. Anna Hazare was going, uh, Prashant Bhushan was going, and nothing was happening. Then suddenly, <coughs> one day, in the Ramlila Maidan, people almost went berserk, and the attendance was huge. And uh, they went berserk because uh, of corruption. My view is that corruption went to a particular level, and that level was tolerated by the people. And when it w went beyond, you had uh, what Gita said, yada yada hi dharma sw So then God came himself on earth, and he gave it to the voters that you have the strength, and only you have the strength, to eliminate corruption, no one else has the strength. You make any number of uh, uh, lecture series, uh, you do anything, people are not going to respond. People will only respond uh, when they realize that they have the power to stop corruption. But who, who, who does this? It didn't happen from uh, 1989 to 2009. It only happened later, and I think it was divine intervention, and also the huge, huge uh, response to Anna Hazare's uh, movements. And the response was so huge that even the Supreme Court, even the government, even the uh, civil society, everyone started reacting to what uh, Anna Hazare was saying. Even the government started cases, CBI cases, this case, that case, etc., and people were very excited. But then everyone realized that this government is going to go, and when it went, it didn't even get 10% of the seats. So corruption, people having tasted uh, blood, are not going to give up on corruption, and that is our only hope. What happened in 2015 was far more interesting. NDA won on uh, corruption and ethics, but NDA lost on, uh, in Delhi. And why did it lose in Delhi? Because people suddenly remembered retail corruption. And it was uh, 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 Arvind Kejriwal who used that very intelligently. He sent his people in his 49 days of government, he did nothing else, uh, in these 49 days of government. And those boys and girls had their pen drives, which were taking photographs and which were recording. And people on the street got very scared, the policemen, the hundreds of inspectors that you have uh, all over the place. And people tell me that corruption really stopped in this 49 days. The scenario in any small officer of this country, you find one thing very obvious, that is people do unethical practices, corrupt practices, when they see the person with whom they are dealing does not belong to them. Suppose you are from Karnataka and you meet an officer in 
Delhi and you tell him that I am from Shimoga and he says, oh, I am also from Badravati. Okay, okay. Then they will not take corruption from you. Someone from Jalandhar sitting in, uh, in Karnataka and another Punjabi goes and talk to him. Oh, ajo, ajo, but ajo, ajo, kar lenge. Tumhara kam koi chinta na kar. Wherever the sense of belongingness ends, that's exactly corruption begins. No one practices corruption with their own folks, but they do it with those whom they consider not belonging to them. Why corruption is bad or why unethical behavior is bad? I asked them to you see, look at from a broader perspective. Then I gave them all the examples where people have risen by unethical behavior and collapsed right back. It's not sustainable for our growth, for our evolution. And simply what is ethics? What you don't want others to do to you, you should not do to others. That's it. The baseline. You don't want your employee to cheat you and so you should not cheat your employee, your employer. This baseline of ethics, if we can inculcate in the society, society changes. I know um, it may appear to be an utopia, but I tell you our youth are so enthusiastic. They like to dream a situation where there is difference where there is humanness, where people can stand up and dream for a better world for their own kids. In Bihar, this was the case. Before Nitish ji came there, people were terribly scared because of the lack of governance. You know, they had to send their kids with with armed men to go to escort them to schools in in city like Patna. You know, when things reach to a peak, that's when exactly people wake up, and we need to wake up. Educated people of this society need to do the job, especially the the teaching faculty, the teachers, the freedom movement of this country was taken to every village, not by someone, not by politicians, by school teachers, by college professors, by people who are uh, guides and gurus of this country. So it is our obligation and responsibility to wake people up to the, the current situation and give them hope. You know, many times people come to know, yeah, this is a problem, but they don't want to take any step because they need, they are looking for someone to lead, take a lead in that. And that leader need not be somebody of some status. It could be anybody and everyone can lead the society. And this is essential, you know. Euphoria can be created very easily, but sustainable change in society does not come from just an andolan, just an euphoria. It comes by hard work, sustained work, change in mindset. Make people aware God is not living only in Gurdwara or temple or church or in mosque, but that humanness or godliness has to be found wherever we are. This change can only happen through ethics, uh, ethical education, inculcating ethics in our education. Role models need to be created for our youngsters. Then when it becomes part of your life, you, it's not an effort that you need to make to get over the habit as uh, Mr. Pradeep Bajpai said, you know, corruption is a habit. Corruption is not habit, it's unawareness lack of culturing, lack of education, a lack of sense of belongingness with the entire population.
ultimately all ethics boils down to this do unto others what you would like others to do unto you now this was said 25 years ago and uh, if you do google search this is called the golden mean in philosophical literature or ethical literature if you just say golden mean on the internet you'll see quite a lot of literature but i think this really sums up all the discussion about ethics do unto others what you would like others to do unto you now ethics you know in a, i am a student of literature and linguistics so i go into the etymology of words and what we call the vyutpatti or uh, the the origin of words uh, we do not have in indian language is an equivalent term to ethics it comes from the greek word ethos so ethos you are familiar with and ethics comes from that uh, and uh, in our indian languages or the entire indian cultural spectrum we have the word dharma now dharma is a wide ranging word in fact in the ashokan edict in afghanistan where there are greek translations also this word is translated into greek as eusebio which means law so uh, law you can say the law or principle of righteousness now dharma the root itself comes from sanskrit thra which means to hold that which sustains is the literal meaning of dharma and uh, we have uh, this concept of righteousness so this concept of righteousness now at the individual level and also at the corporate level also at the government level you know, it holds because this is what sustains and the question is how do you square your personal values with your corporate values or your uh, administrative uh, responsibilities and this is a real dilemma Bajal Sahib mentioned about the Tatas. Now, this incident was narrated to me by someone who was in the board meeting, CEO of a bank. There was some amount, many crores, I suppose, which was recovered from some party, and the board of Tata Sons at that time, maybe even now, this is again some 25 years or 30 years back, comprised. old people old parsi baba ji so the person who was in charge of recovery a legal person he very proudly uh, narrated to the board that yes this 30 crores or 40 crores or whatever was the amount had been recovered and then one of these old parsi gentlemen a member of the board said there are laws of god and there are laws of man and we are at a stage in life where very soon we'll be answering the maker according to the laws of god and not laws of man now tell us is this according to the laws of god is it morally justified legally yes it's legally justified and you have recovered the amount was it morally justified so he thought and he said no it is not morally justified then he said return the amount so this 30 crores or whatever amount was returned now this is an example of ethical behavior the administrative reforms commission as bajal sir mentioned has divided corruption among the major corruption and minor corruption or retail corruption but the fact is from an individual point of view you hold your conscience tight you loosen it it seeps through so retail corruption means you are still loosening your uh, so this is the question about ethics how tight can you hold your hands against corruption there are compromises everywhere 
what price one is going to pay for sticking to one's values. So ultimately, it's a question of values. As Mr. Lin said, uh, values are what you learn at your mother's knee. Now, you are students of management, and all of you, for, for many of you, Peter Drucker probably is one of the um, uh, uh, demigods you follow. Now, Drucker says, there is uh, neither a separate ethics of business nor is one needed. It's, I think it's a, it's a very pertinent observation. There is neither a separate ethics of business nor is one needed because it's your personal values which matter. Now, if you hold tight to your personal values, then the business accordingly, I mean, you'll conduct yourself in that manner, but again, Again, where do you say, uh, where, where do we hold the line? When you are downsizing and you are uh, uh, looking at the future of the company or your corporation, but not the individual, and how do you square your personal concern for the welfare of your employees against the welfare of your corporation? So these are the kind of dilemmas that, that you face and there are no easy answers. Uh, again, if you want to go ahead in a worldly sense, uh, you'll probably make compromises. If you want to go ahead in a spiritual sense, you'll probably pay the price. In life, there is the inner journey and there is the external journey. The problem here is how do you maintain the balance between the two journeys? So this is, I think, the major ethical question and the major ethical dilemma. Each one has to find for himself or herself. Now, in the business literature, you'll say that, you know, I suppose most corporations follow it also, that you do not break laws. You keep on the right side of law, and the rest of it is it's just a question of giving your shareholders the maximum profit. And in government, the governance. Uh, so how do you ensure that while doing that, uh, no underhand dealings are uh, done? Of course, everybody who pays a bribe knows that they are doing a wrong thing. Everybody does, who does uh, these compromises knows that, yes, a compromising is being made. But knowingly you do this, knowingly you pay the price, Knowingly, you make the compromise. So it's not that you are compelled to do this. It's just that your personal value system does not trouble you about this. And going ahead in the career, in, in, in material terms, is what you are looking at. So boils down to your personal values. And uh, so applied ethics or normative ethics, uh, these are not in that sense abstract terms. You will be faced with these questions every day. Uh, you have to decide for yourself. Now, very simple thing. Uh, environmental laws are very strict. It's very simple that when you are discharging the effluents, you do not do it downstream. You do it upstream from the point where you are drawing the water. But discharging it upstream means a much greater cost, which reduces your uh, profits. Your bottom line is affected. So what compromise you make on this? This is the kind of dilemma you will find every, in every situation. Whether you are in government or you are in private sector, public sector, etc., these questions will always be there. You'll be faced with these questions.